And we're back with another episode of QGIS Road to Nerdvana. This is episode 31, Why GIS Professionals Should Code. And I'm joined today by my merry band of GIS practitioners at um, Cartosa. Let's introduce first Admire. Hi everyone, good morning. Amy. Hi everyone, happy Valentine's Day for yesterday. Oh, great. Devon. Hi there. Victoria. Hello. Charlie. How's it? And Sia Hi everyone. I take it Thiasha is not in the room yet. If, I, if you are, then say hello, Thiasha. Um, who got the prize for the most upbeat <laughs> greeting? I guess it's a, it's a tie between Admire and Amy there. Um, <laughs> So today we're, we're going to be talking about uh, why, why you should learn to code and I thought I would start um, just with some context about, about um, like why should you learn to code and then we're going to just look at the basics of like what a programming language is and um, it's more of a discussion but we're going to share it on the internet so that other people can or maybe add weigh in on, on the discussion as well. But um, so my opinion is that I, I, I would start just with sort of like a personal reflection. I'm not a computer scientist, and I think nobody around this table is a computer scientist by training, right? Is anybody that did a comp sci undergrad or? Um, no. So we're all in the same boat in a way, and um, although I am a total absolute computer nerd, but um, I, for some reason, never went and studied computer science. Um, and um, I think that there is a perception if you're a GIS professional that computer science is its own craft and it's best left to the computer scientists and programming is something that you should not have to do as a GIS professional because your job is to make pretty maps and point and click around and pan and zoom and load layers and maybe uh, run, run the script that somebody else wrote and so on. And I want to sort of debunk that idea a little bit and maybe approach it from a, a different perspective and the way that I, I want to describe it is like this like everybody learns to speak English or whatever your home language is when they grow up and um, not everybody becomes a, a, a language specialist not everybody goes off and becomes an English teacher or English professor or um, does a deep study of the language that they speak but we all treat it as a functional component of our everyday lives right we we can't speak we can't express ourselves we can't ask for a loaf of bread in the shop or what have you and um, when we're on a computer the, the language um, that we converse with is you know prog a programming language usually and if you want to be fully expressive you can do a lot of things just by pointing clicking around but um, it's like kind of learning um, like just the basics of a language rather than being able to fully speak it. Um, so maybe Charles and, and Admire and Devon and those who've already done coding may maybe want to add something like to the thought of you know of like that computer programming is not uh, a vocational thing that should be only done by computer scientists but should be something that everybody knows. Would you like agree with the statement or um, Disagree with it because you've never actually used to program in your career. Uh, who, who goes first? I go first alphabetically. Ah, you can go, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, from my perspective, um, GIS as a field, you know, geographic information systems, information systems, pretty much refers to like the computation of the data and the management of that like digital data. You know, so it, it, to me, it, it's actually kind of. Uh, uh, field that combines computer science and geography into one kind of domain. And there are different aspects to GIS, so cartography and design and user experience and so on is not necessarily like uh, computer science heavy, um, you know, in, in terms of management of skills and so on. But the domain is also like, it, 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 there's a lot to the vertical. So like when it comes to solution architecture, when it comes to data management, like our data is typically, if you, you're managing your data effectively, it's often stored in a relational database, which is a computer science domain. Um, you know, we, we take all the computer science uh, concepts 
and like the relational database management, and then we add geometry, so we make it more complicated. Um, then, you know, there's the management of large data sets, like aerial imagery and so on. Um, you know, there's the solution architecture, like uh, if, you, if you think about OGC standards, like, and, and web services and so on, like, we as, like, if you're a solution architect and you're in, in a GIS world, you essentially have to be a multi-domain specialist. You have to understand and manage web servers. You have to understand and manage web services. You have to understand and manage uh, spatial uh, data geometry. You know, projection, projection uh, information or, or coordinate reference systems. systems. Like, like there, there are so many aspects of it that are like interrelated with computer science itself uh, that just thinking of GIS as its own kind of Concept you, uh, to me, GIS, like I said, is, is just computer science and geography kind of combined into a single field. Um, but it does like it, it, it branches out quite of like a kind of dynamically. Like I say, if you're doing a design and UX and cartography and so on, maybe computer science is not that big a deal. If you're going into things like uh, remote sensing and you're using things like machine learning and, and those kind of algorithms. Uh, you're doing a lot more kind of like theoretical computer science in, in that domain. So it does kind of like depend on where you sit on the scale and what your kind of day-to-day -day tasks are. But I think in terms of like, uh, firstly, like the, the, the technological landscape is changing. So uh, actually learning and memorizing commands to give a computer is not as much of a requirement as it was before. You're getting low-code tools and like model builders and so on that like uh, they allow you to express computational logic um, in like a much easier to use interface, which is great. And almost everybody needs to de develop that skill for data management, for automation, for consistency. Um, giving computer commands through a command line interface, you know, to improve efficiency and so on, that's kind of a requirement as well. So there is a lot to it, um, but basically, even if you don't develop like the specific skill of a particular programming language, you know, connecting to an API, building plugins, and that sort of thing, at least understanding how a computer, how a computer processes information, how that log logic is structured, is an absolute necessity to me, anyway. Um, you know, like <laughs> I suppose I sit on the like a, a different scale to, to most other people in that, despite not having formal training in GIS and not having an undergraduate degree, you know, I got to be a GIS specialist just because I was a computer nerd <laughs> and I started working in the field just doing data capture. So, like, if you want to be an effective GIS specialist, to me, the computer science aspect is, is like, probably as important, if not more important than, you know, general GIS concepts um, in order to be, like, highly skilled and effective. And like you know, at least to to move forward. Like I said, it does depend on your kind of area of expertise or your specialty um, and your day-to-day -day tasks. But for me, it's just kind of like a critical skill that people need to um, work towards. Like, if not like a specific skill, like web development or so on, um, at least that computational logic, that ability to automate tasks um, for the various reasons that I specified. And that's my two cents on it. <laughs> Cool. And uh, how about you, Admire? Have you do you think that one can escape um, ever needing to code if you want to be a GIS professional? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think there's a synergy between the actual GIS work that you do and and running computer science. In most cases, you would find you need to automate a lot of tasks, and the way that the automate tasks is like, well, it's Charlie to say that they are like low code tools like model builder. But sometimes you'd find that they are a bit limited in terms of the context in which you can use them. So it would be quite important for people to, to basically understand a bit of coding just to manipulate like model builder scripts to, to your own preference. That might help them a lot. And also, there's a lot of computational science that are involved, like, for example, in, in map projections. Just for you to understand what's actually happening there, you need to, to know a bit of background in terms of computer science as well. And as we can see these days, there's a lot of computer scientists that are migrating to the field of GIS because it is quite easy for them to grasp the concepts of, of GIS than, than the other way around. But it's also important for GIS practitioners to, 
to also aggravate towards mastering all the the programming that is available in the in the in the computer science world. And it's not it's not only about just writing the code. Maybe just reading it and understanding it is also a very important tool to have as a GIS analyst. And then you can maybe hand over that task to someone who is well clued up in understanding the different concepts that are there in the computer science. Thanks, Edmire. And Divan, have you got any thoughts to add to the to the rationale <coughs> of why you should um, learn to co a little bit of coding? Uh, pretty much Admire and Charlie covered all the important aspects, but I can give like a good example mm -hmm. on what I've done previously with uh, for research purposes, uh, we worked with uh, thousands of data sets for, for thousands of sample points and going through all of that and doing machine learning regressions and everything manually without coding would have taken us forever to do, where with coding we were able to completely automate all of it. And if you make, want to add more data or quickly do a rerun with a few new parameters, you can easily just change something and run it again and just leave it running um, without the need to um, keep giving input and makes it much easier and more efficient to do it like that as opposed to doing it manually. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we're sort of establishing uh, a case for why you should learn a little bit of coding and I say a little bit of coding because um, you know that we've got we've established this continuum here between you know just using the tools clicking around in QGIS for example running in and like you know picking an analysis tool and running it individually to like doing things which are a bit more like um, involve a bit more cohesion between different tools like uh, building models and things like that through to eventually building your own tools and that's really like um, like trying to take you on a journey where you have the maximum expressiveness where expressiveness in terms of like you can understand the problem you're trying to solve and you can think of a way to actually um, express yourself on the computer to actually solve the problem like Devon's example of um, processing hundreds of data sets or what have you so um, so that's the context that I wanted to give you and, and um, Sia Biwe, Amy and Vicky um, you, you mentioned like before we started recording that you had some like <laughs> they almost sound a little bit negative experiences with, with how you were exposed to coding and, and different languages and things and, and I think a lot of people where especially when they start their career if they haven't ever done coding they often do have this kind of like negative um, outlook towards the idea of coding like it's complicated it's um, too nerdy or it's like a lot of details that they like can't visualize easily on a you know map on a screen or what have you so like uh, I wanted to like have the session to kind of like break that away break that perception down a bit and explain to you the basic concepts of coding in a way that is kind of simple and approachable and then hopefully get you into the get you excited enough that you might go off and create your own first script even if it's something really simple and potentially useless to the rest of the world but but you know that it, it allows you to just get your feet wet a little bit in the world of, of writing your own code um, um tim mm -hmm. can i also add something yes, to that yeah. i think it's on my side it's not that i didn't like it it depend it i think it depends also on the person who is giving you the information who is providing you the information in terms of coding and mm. the person who's teaching and, and also if the person is enthusiastic about what they are teaching you so i think on, on like on my side it depended on the person so if the person was not as excited as i would expect them to be when they were teaching me during my varsity days then for me it was like okay let me just learn it for the sake of me having to just pass and move on mm. so yeah Rather so i think also it depends on the person so it depends on the person who's teaching you also in terms of what energy are they giving you towards this this topic so yeah yeah so 100 percent. so hopefully we'll get you excited enough <laughs> that you want to go and actually do some coding and try things out and um it's not our expectation that you go off and become like well it would be great if you become the world's like next uh, i don't know who's who's a famous coder i don't know um 
uh, Bill Gates, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, but I don't know how much code he writes anymore. But um, I thought you were going to say yourself too. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm <laughs> Niall Dawson, Ulysses, Niall Dawson. Or, or um, you know, one of our... Um, we can dream. <laughs> Martin Dubias or somebody. You know, we can't all be them. Um, but, but I think we can basically leverage the tools more effectively by, by moving our ability to express ourselves like along this path here. So um, I wanted to just talk a, a little bit about the main concepts and again, Charlie, admire, Divan, um, jump in if you want to add something here, but um, of coding, because I think most people, when they get introduced to coding, they just get thrown into a language like uh, uh, Python or JavaScript or something, and there's very little context about like what it is you're actually doing when you're coding. So I wanted to keep things kind of high level in the session and talk about like what are the high level constructs that actually make up the language. And the, the, the constructs there probably are some similarities to like spoken language as well, but then also some things that are different. So the, I'm going to just put some like ideas here. Um, um, like the first one I want to talk about was um, let's do assignment. Um, maybe we need variables. Um, uh, expressions, um, uh, uh, iteration. I'm sure I'm leaving some of the other key building blocks out. Uh, um, conditionals and conditionals. Yeah. Let's just call it conditions to keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, what did you, Admire? You said something else as well? Functions. Okay, yeah. Functions and for good good measure we'll add classes as well just to Okay, so I'll just move these things a little bit out of the way until we need to copy them. So um let's do a quick poll um with Amy, Siobiwe and Vicky. Which of these words do you recognize and could you try to explain what the ones that you recognize are variables. Yeah, I was about to say Functions. <laughs> okay, so, so um, CMB will give us your best um, effort at explaining what a variable is. So from my understanding, variables are, um, I'm looking for the word, variables are things that you need to be able to use them for a certain function. So for you to be able to um, create a certain function, you need a, you need certain variables that you can add to that specific um, to that specific function for it to function. I don't know if I'm making sense. Um, how, well, let's grade Sibiwe's <laughs> explanation on one to 10. Charlie? Uh, I understand. <laughs> admire, admire. <laughs> Uh, maybe f three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Divan. Uh, I'm also not understanding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm also going to give you like a, a sort of, I think Maya's being very, he's a kind soul, but I think I'm going to go with a one um, CLB word. So um, let's, let's say, um, let's try to give a better explanation for it. Um, my explanation in the most simple way, I think, is um, it's a, an area of storage in the computer's memory. Okay, that you that you allocate, and so, um, uh, and even a simpler way is it's like a, a bucket or a container that you put information into. Um, any improvements on my? Um, uh, you're talking about memory <laughs> for high level stuff. <laughs> I would say it's a placeholder. So, like you know, when you when you use a variable, it's like using like a template. Like you can replace it at a later stage or define it beforehand, and, and so on. So I would just say it's a placeholder for some element uh, inside your code. Okay, so I'm yeah. going to get a, a three as well from the admire score of um, variable <laughs> explanations. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's add a little bit of my technical thing there and say it's a placeholder for storing information. Okay, that takes Charlie's simple explanation and also puts a concept of the, like that's being stored in the computer's brain somewhere. Um, how about um, assignment? Anybody heard of that term before? Okay. 
Nej, det kan ju... Att det... För mig är alignment means uh, you assign a value to a mm. variable. So using Charlie's explanation, it's putting some putting information in the bucket. Yeah, I think that's uh, what. It, let's get the scoring from the the, the crew there, um, Charlie. That that was like an eight for me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I thought that was pretty on point. Did my uh... yeah, same same eight. Indeed. Ivan, anything to add to? Uh, no, not at the moment. Process of storing. I think it, if I can't write it in my box, then my explanation is too long, right? Um, let's just say, let's take out this fancy terminology. Of, this is storing uh, storing information in a variable. How about that? Just change the font size to like six and then uh, you know, <laughs> the, the older fogies can't read it, fine. It's already at 62, so I've got lots of, uh, lots of shrinkage possibilities here. Okay, cool. So basically, the assignment is by the process by which um, information gets put into a variable. And if I flip this around, I can actually put a little arrow like this between these two things here. And... Um, uh, Like yeah, maybe maybe you, could, you, could, you could add it as well, one example of an operator that could be used to do the assignment, like an equals. Okay, let's put the term operator here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Doesn't an operator fall within a function? Um, I would say functions use operators, but um, operators... Uh, Actually, operators are also a function if we want to get fancy. But yeah, I think mm -hmm. they're two discrete thing, things. Let's, um, we can go into that a little bit. Let's, let's do that. So what is an operator? That's, um, Admire, do you want to give a, a nice explanation of what an operator is? Uh, an operator is, a, I'd say it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an assignment that allows you to, to equate to something. Like, for example, an equal sign, you'd say, I want the left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side. So that's the operators that you, you have there. Uh, I think a combination of, of your explanations, the, the key thing Admire said is sign, so it's like a mathematical sign. But the other key thing is that, to mention, it's like its own function. So it's just like a mathematical function that is, you know, represented as a sign in your code. So um, modulo is a percentage you know, yep. uh, you know, a, a carrot or whatever is, you know, um, a power to, you know, exponent. Uh, so, so mathematical operations, essentially, so uh, greater than, equal to, less than, min, max, and so on, uh, sometimes can maybe be like included in operators, but they're, they're typically like separate functions. But uh, your, your basics are equal or not equal to yeah, modulo and that sort of thing. So uh, mathematical sign is <laughs> like the oversimplification of <laughs> what an do, operator is. Do and an or fit in there too? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I think if we're keeping it at a high level, I think we can just say they are, I wanted to write tools, but they are, they are things that let you compare and manipulate variables. So for example, I yeah. can take some information and put it into a variable, or I can take two variables and find out are they the same thing, are they different things, how are they different, is the one inverse of the other one, is the one bigger than the other one, smaller than the other one, what have you. They're just basically things that let you, um, like almost, if I take my arrow here, I should actually use an operator to do an assignment like this. Um, um, so an assignment is actually one like uses one special kind of operator to assign something to a variable using the so the, so they basically determine the kind of operation that needs to be performed mm -hmm. um, how about this idea of an expression um like for me an expression is a set of instructions that you give to the computer for it to do something and it can include operations, operators and functions, but it's basically the instruction. Hopefully that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty good. Um, anything to, to comment on that uh, from Charlie Devon Admire? 
I think instruction, like as a high level, like explanation, is pretty good. I mean, you're combining a series of like functions and operators Ooh. and variables into an expression. Um, so if we so. took this this three blocks together, the process of doing the like compare A with B is an expression, right? It's uh, saying like yeah, like you said, like an instruction to to the computer to take these two things and do some operation on them. Did I just make a square now? Um, oh god, hang on a second. Um, so we could actually draw a little box around this set of things and say that if we um, if we um, let me put that to the back. Context menu, menu is not in Portuguese. Oh no, there it is now. Oh, uh, some of them didn't get translated. <laughs> yeah. No translation for that line. Para uh, trás. Okay, that's what I need. Okay, okay. So if we put these things here, like this, in a group, like an expression might be um, let a equal five something. So that's an expression to say like I want you to do this specific set of tasks or, or this specific task. Um, but well, can, doesn't function also fall into expressions? Well, isn't the function just a collection of expressions? Uh, you could have a function that does count the number of words and then you... Yeah, edit. aggregation functions and all sorts of different functions get applied to variables in an expression, I would say. Yeah. I would have just said like a function is just a convenience way to combine many expressions together in the same, like in, in one um, unit. Uh, or no. Well, they're, they're not really mutually exclusive. Like you use expressions and functions and functions and expressions. Expressions um, can be functions. I mean, they're just, they're building blocks of each other, right? But I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, I should rather say... And then you get spaghetti code. <laughs> I should rather, <laughs> we'll rather teach say, everyone about that later. Yeah, yeah. We've got to do some spaghetti. Um, rather than saying can be, I should have said probably are, right? Because um, usually every programming language is just starts off with something very, very basic and then they go and build a bunch of functions that add more and more like high-level things. So if you start like with QGIS, in the beginning, we just had like something that said, like, um, draw dots on the screen or something like that. And then we thought, oh, well, hang on. What if we draw, connected the lines together, and uh, the dots together to make a line, and we'd have like a higher level function, which is like, draw the dots as a line, uh, which combines the dot function, you know, multiple times. Um, and you sort of just like create these layers of complexity. And the functions are just like creating your a rich vocabulary of named things that you can do in the language. Um, I'm getting lost in my notes here. So these are, um, uh, uh, what, did, what is the succinct version of a function? Instruction set. Instruction set. Okay, and then this one we can say is a group of expressions. I think they're, they're probably, the purists are probably moaning at us from the side saying, well, that's not always true. But for the general case, um, uh, yeah, so we've got this group of expressions which together can make a function. And we've pretty much covered all of programming language except for a couple of things. Do we need conditions? Because the condition operator is just a kind of, a condition is just a kind of operator, isn't it? We could go and create some taxonomy about operators there. Um, this idea of iteration, has anybody heard of that idea from Amy, Vicky and Siobiwe? Um, is it not um, running a series of, um, for example, um, expressions? When we... mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah, okay, okay. 
can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. No, I was, I was, I was thinking yeah, that could it, be, um, could it be like running a series of um, expressions, for example, say maybe you want to look at like, so you're running a series of expressions until you're able to get um, some sort of results from it. So you have like um, an expression, probably maybe you want to look at something about climate change and then but you have an expression that you're able to use and then you you're running those um different iterations until you're able to get to that particular answer that you need or some sort of result yeah i think i mean if we wanted to make it more simple we could just say repeatedly doing an action or a set of actions right it's just um it's a loop yeah it's a loop. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the simple <laughs> definition i suppose um, so, so basically you do a loop over like a series or, you know, and, and, and like this ties in very closely with conditionals because you might do um, for each, you know, loop for every like instance of something in, in a set or you might do like um, while something is true. So, you know, while, you know, if you want to do 10 loops, then you say, you know, count each loop and when you uh, while the the loop number is, is less than 10 you know keep keep on looping otherwise stop so that's the simple kind of if you if you want to make an analogy like if you've got a bag of shopping right um and you want to give somebody a set of instructions to like empty the bag of shopping and uh, put it in the fridge or whatever you, you'd say basically place a bag on the table and then start taking items out one at a time, put them in the fridge until there's no more items, right? And that, that sort of like language is very similar to what the computer uses. It says, like, do something until something happens. Or while there's no more shopping in the bag, uh, while there's still shopping in the bag, keep taking the next item out. And that's all iteration does in the computer. It just looks at a collection of things or a range of things and uh, operates in sequence over that range until condition is met like it could be um, until you're tired then you can also stop or it could be until you find the first rotten banana in the bag and then you can stop or whatever you can like create um, conditions to determine when the iteration should stop but if, if the condition is not met then the computer just keeps on repeating that, that same action over and over um, we had uh, I sort of feel like condition should be in the, in the picture somewhere, but anyway, I, I can't find a good home for it quite yet, and I don't want to make Just it. Just put it under operators. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll make it like, a, give it its own color and give it a smaller little thing up here. Sorry to degrade your importance conditions, but there you go. Is everyone still with me, um, Amy, Vicky, and Siobhiwe? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then we have one more concept, um, which is this thing of a class, which is where, it's, actually for me, it makes programming simple, but it also makes it a bit complicated because um, you're adding a new level of abstraction. But basically, for me, a class is um, uh, it's a way to represent real-world real objects in your programming um, language. So, for example, if you were working in um, in an object-orientated programming language, which is where classes are used, then you go and construct a reality in the programming language, um, and you create a class for each entity. So, for example, if, you, if you're writing a program to describe a car, you would have a class for a door, a class for a bonnet, a class for a windscreen, um, and each of those ones can encapsulate their own behaviors. So. Um, adding like uh, classes to programming language really took programming to another level because you you could start to um, interact with the language as if you were interacting with the real thing. You could say, for example, door close, and then when they close the, the door, because the door was part of the car, the car might know that, okay, my door number one is closed. And um, you, you basically create this like, um, like, virtual reality inside the computer but by defining all the concepts in the domain and how they interact with each other. And classes so classes are sort of like one level above functions again. Would you want to have a better a stab at a better explanation? Um, 
Charlie and Admire and Devon? I think if we're in a, in a GIS context, um, like it's, it's worth kind of mentioning that you can think of a class as like a data structure and then an object as like an instance of that, you know, that it, well, an, an item, an object with that data structure. So, um, for example, when you have a layer that has geometry, or, you know, regardless of geometry type, um, you know, you've got your attribute table and that's your data structure and it tells you what attributes that record has, you know, but when you want to change something and add a column with more information and so on, then you're essentially changing the data structure. So like your, your class kind of mutates in, in that sense. So your layer essentially like forms a class of objects. Um, like that, that's kind of how it would, like I would try and describe it for like a GIS context or audience. Um, it does get a lot more complicated than that. Uh, and like when you start looking into um, like object oriented programming and you know what it entails and things like polymorphism and whatnot it gets like scary and, and lots of like strange jargon and concepts and, and and so on thrown around but i think like in simple terms it's worth understanding that it's just you know a class pretty much just defines like a, a, a data structure which defines in turn like the attributes of an object um and like computers don't they can't just infer stuff you know uh, as, as humans do, we kind of need to be explicit in everything we define for them. So it makes managing uh, data and projects and so on much uh, easier. And a lot of, of course, uh, things that you encounter in the wild, like plugins and so on and, and frameworks, they're all going to use classes to like define objects in that code. And you, you will see them like pop up from time to time. Yeah, OK. So uh, we're probably getting a bit into the weeds. With, with it, but just the, uh, bear in mind that these things are just levels of abstraction. So the most like low-level concepts are down here, like um, assignment operators and variables. Ultimately, Charlie was teasing me for talking about computer memory, but ultimately you're m putting things into the computer's memory and moving it around the memory and uh, removing it out of the memory again with these like low-level things, and then. The higher level things are saying like compare two parts of the computer's memory to each other or um, add them to each other or do some something between two pieces of computer's memory or two pieces of information if you want to think of it like that rather. And then a function is saying like I want to combine a bunch of different operations together in one group so that it's easier for me to call them all together. And then a class says I want to create a conceptual framework where I describe things um, based on their real world characteristics and behaviors. So for example, a point in QGIS is a class and, a cl and, and then you think like, what should a point be able to do? Well, it should be able to, um, uh, actually well, let's go find out what you can do with a, a, a point in QGIS, but um, uh, QGIS point X, Y. Just go here and look in the class reference, they'll say to you, well, a point is a QGIS reference point, uh, something like it, it inherits some characteristics. And then here's all the things it can do. You can create a point from another point. You can create a point from a pair of X, Y coordinates, which makes sense, yeah. Um, uh, and then you can also say, well, give me that point back as well-known text format, which is just like, um, uh, you know, like a text string, basically what's the azimuth of this point compare this point to another point and they, like we basically just got in here a list of all the things that you should be able to do with a point and so these are called methods of the of the class they're basically all the things that it can do and then the um, properties of the class are its actual x and y coordinate that that make it up so if you go through all of QGIS and all of any like most modern programming environments, they're going to have something like this, like a document which describes all the things you can do with each of the, the different classes. And you'll see here these operators which allow for assignments. So for example, I can say, what happens if I say this point is, should be equal to that point? Well, it will copy the x and y value from the other point into this one. What happens if I do this one here, which is a comparison? So it says, what if, if I want to compare two points, how do I do it? Well, I check if the x of this one is the same as the x of that one. I check if the y of this one is the same as that one. 
and maybe I'll also check if the coordinate reference system is the same, for example. And so all and then that will return true or false. <laughs> yeah, it will return true or false. And all QGIS is doing is basically implementing, taking all these concepts in the GIS space, a line, a point, a polygon, a raster, uh, and then higher level things like a canvas or, a, um, or the application window itself, and thinking about all the behaviors that each of these things should, be ha uh, should have, and then implementing them in, in code, um, and providing those functions to you to use in your code. So um, if we jumped over to the to the to Q just quickly, we can actually just go and play a little bit with that. Like if we go to the um, uh, there's this very nice thing that in Q just that lets you um, uh, how do I make a new document? Um, uh, that lets you basically like do some simple coding without really needing to go through all the all the process of getting a coding environment set up and everything. Uh, there's the plus button right there. So if I, um, if I, for example, say um, point, oh, that's a nice big font. <laughs> equals, can you just point x y, and I pass it, um, I pass it to like two values, an, uh, an x value. Let's say it's ten, and the y value. Right, and then I run this little script here. Let's just save it quickly. Um, okay, so I save that and run it. Then, um, uh, is it running the right thing? Okay, so it, it didn't actually do anything because it just basically created this point and then. Um, kind of like exited, but if I said like um, uh, print, and now I've got all those, remember all those functions I was showing you there, like let's go to that, the WKT one. I think this is the C++ API documentation. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't matter, yeah, yeah, it'll be this, yeah. I could actually go to the QGIS Python API. So for <laughs> I, I, anyone like getting a bit confused like basically QGIS has another layer of abstraction on like the lower level programming stuff that produces this Python API and that makes it easier for people who don't know like various programming language to like um, I mean it, it uses a lot of the same concepts classes and so on but it, it, it abstracts it to make it easier to work with um, for a, a wider audience essentially. So if we do, I'm now in the Python documentation, you'll see that it um, looks different, but it's actually got the same concepts in it. So for example, there's the um, ASWKT and all these other things that you can do with it. It's just laid out a little bit differently to the other one. Um, and if you go look at any particular one, you see, for example, this ASWKT will return a well-known text representation of the point. For example, it might give you something back like Point x, y, with x and y being the um, latitude, uh, longitude and latitude of the point. So if we go here and we say point dot as wkt, and then uh, we just print that out. Let's see what happens. So what it did is just printed back my point for me there, and um, make that a bit bigger so you can see it. So like knowing the, these basic concepts of um, coding, like we can actually map what I did to some of these things, right? So for example, what is point? Someone's going to have to step in, up and answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to um, hazard a guess what point is? Sorry, I'm not Ricky, unmuted. Yay! I saw that, Vicky. <laughs> yeah, it's. I keep clicking it and it goes back. Uh, um, it, it, I was saying that point is a variable in this case. Indeed, it's a variable. And what is this thing here? Q just point x y. Um, is it an an a instance function? of a class? It is, and that's beautifully described. That's a ten, ten out of ten. Um, yeah, description. <laughs> I'm applauding. <laughs> <in the background. laughs> I can 
say instance, which we sometimes refer to as an object as well. So an instance. Yes, I wanted to say an object. <coughs> it is an instance of a class. An instance means that the class of uh, point x y is just the descriptive thing of like what a point x y is, and then an instance of it is like make me one of those point x y things, please, and I I want to be able to hold it in my hand and do stuff with it. Yeah. Or, all the general computer's memory in this case and do stuff. Yeah, a, a class says a point has an X and a Y, and an instance says, give me a, a class of point with X of 10 and Y of 10. I mean, yeah. Basically. It. Okay, and then we had um, these two things here. So where did they fall in our... Um, or, or like, or let's say, what is the... What is this... Um, thing do in uh, in its entirety. So we said there's a variable and there's a class, right? Or an instance. What does this whole line do? Amy, have Sign a go. Is it a reassigning? Exactly. Yeah. So I am lost. <laughs> you lost or you lost? <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> you lost. Okay. So let's go over the point we agreed as a variable. Are you are you mm -hmm. agreed with that? Yes. Um, Q just point X, Y, we agreed was a class, right? One of these things. It, it describes mm -hmm. like what a point should do, right? Yes. And then this whole piece here is an instance of a Q just point X, Y. Because we've said, like, make me a new point x, y, and set the longitude to 10 and the latitude to 10. Does that make sense for you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then having this little equals here, uh, it's called an assignment. It says, basically, take that instance that I created. If I didn't assign it to something, the computer would just basically okay. generate it and then uh, throw it away again when the program stopped running. But, well, not when the program stopped running, but when the line stopped you know when you went, moved on to the next line of the, of the program but having this here i can say actually i want to make this point thing and i want to assign it to my point variable yeah i could call this anything i like um let's call it abby's wonderful point okay <laughs> <laughs> so i'm just assigning this concept of a q just point into this thing here which is a like a bucket the Abby's wonderful point bucket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you with us now? Yes. I'm okay. And then I and then I took that point. Okay. I have to change the name now because they must match. Yeah. So I said like take the wonderful point and um, now I've got that thing as an object which I can do stuff with. So one of the things I can do with it is I can ask it for its well-known text representation. So. This dot here says, like, what, are, what am I trying to do to that point? Um, uh, like, how can I describe the dot? It's like an action indicator. It says, like, take the point and perform this action, the as WKT action on it. Right. And then um, instead of assigning that result, I just said print it. You know, and then it prints it on the screen. Are you, st are you with us still on that second part, Abby? Or? No, I'm good. Okay. And basically, when we start to write code, then what we do is we just create lists of these different expressions, assignments, variable allocations, calling functions on variables. So if I wanted to, for example, um, find out what else I could do, I can come to here and I say, like, what can I actually do with a point? Oh, I can actually uh, return a distance between a point and another xy coordinate. So let's go and see if we can do that. So we say, um, uh, I think can we can we just clarify a couple yeah. of things with this yeah. kind of expression that you've got going on that I think people might want to know. Um, the one thing is what are you know when you when you're like doing that assignment. So you've got the you've got the variable Abby is wonderful point. You've got the operator which is the equal sign, and then you've got the class Q just point X Y. Um, but what what we haven't covered is you know those things that go into the class there that is. Uh, what we might call arguments, or uh, uh, sometimes it's referred to as parameters. Typically, it's supposed to be called 
like named parameters, um, in which case you would actually like give like the, the, the parameter a, a name so that the, the uh, method that assigns these things knows what it's doing. So the attempt adding the names to make make it parameters. Uh, arguments are typically just like you know positional like uh, argument one, two, three, four, but it, but it haven't really covered arguments for anyone who was wondering what that was. Um, and then the as well known text uh, that's that's being run at the end there, that is a method which is essentially just a function that belongs to a class. So uh, an, a class itself has a series of functions and we call those methods. Um, and that's why it's got those uh, brackets, the, the parenthesis at the end. So as well-known text, and then you have to use the, the parenthesis to indicate that it's a method. Um, and that particular method does not actually take any arguments or parameters, so it's blank. If it did take, you know, like some, like as distance, if you, um, that, that Tim's gonna talk about now, you know, you might take point 0.1 and point 0.2 as arguments. So. That's basically like the, the structure of this entire like expression. So you, uh, the the method itself is pretty much just a function. You can just think of it as a function that belongs to a class. And those are just elements that I think you know people watching might <laughs> have been wondering what they were. Um, yeah. So uh, this method takes some different arguments. You, I can see what the arguments are here because it says it needs an x and a y. Yeah. And so. Um, I can pass those arguments here, and then if I run my program, I just save it and run it again. Um, okay, it says, oh, I did something wrong here. Let's see what I did wrong. I don't get the embedded syntax to not show that again. It wants it all to be together there like that. Let's just go like that. Um, just save it and run it again. And now I've calculated the distance from um, 10, the point at 10, comma 10 to the point at 20, comma 20 by just calling this method distance and I, and I gave it in that method the arguments it wanted, which were where the new point is that you're trying to measure to. Yeah. And so um, then it becomes like programming just becomes actually kind of, well, a lot of programming is kind of this fun thing of just like exploring all these things that have been made available to you in what's called the API, the application programming interface, which is a kind of unwieldy term for like the list of functions and methods and classes that, that are um, available in a programming environment. And, uh, and then you can start to really have fun. You can say, well, I, you know, what, let me just try like, uh, I don't know, let's pick a random thing here and see what like the square root distance is between uh, two points or what have you, or um, how can I project this? You know, just like exploring around here and seeing all the things you can do. Um, which is like when we started the conversation, that's how I landed up making making this, you know, because I just said, oh, you know what, I can create a co coordinate reference system on the fly or I can um, tell Q just to pan the canvas and take a snapshot of it. So like, what? how can I like chain all those different functions together to start making uh, something interesting or something that solves my problem? And really that's all uh, programming ultimately lands up being is just a, a defining a collection of instructions for the computer to run in sequence so that it solves your problem. I think maybe it's a good time to stop because we're going to start going into a lot of detail and so on. And I really wanted to just do like a high level thing of saying like, you know, um, maybe programming is not actually so scary <laughs> if you just um, can get past some basic terminology like um, I'm learning Portuguese and I'm really suffering because I'm like learning all the, I have to learn all this new um, uh, terminologies and grammar for example like and I, like once I once I understand like how the framework of the language works it's a lot easier for me to then learn the language itself and the same with programming if you understand these basic concepts then you should be able to go to any new language and kind of like look for how do they do assignments? How do they um, do operators between variables? How do they create, like, what does a variable look like? And, and, and once you know all those concepts exist, you can just go look for them in the language. So I'm going to stop recording, but uh, like with post recording, we can actually go and do a little um, exploration and I'm going to try and write some like hello world thing in R, which I've never programmed in before and see if we can look for these concepts here and just kind of find them in that language and use them to do something simple. Uh, Charlie, you want to I add think, something? 
Yeah, I, I think just to like, <laughs> so that people don't get scared of um, from programming. I mean, we saw Tim there had like a syntax error and like debugging and problems popping up in code is common. It happens to everyone. So if you get frustrated while learning, that's normal. Um, but I, I think it's worth like, you know, adding like abstraction to it in the sense that, you know, essentially programming is just issuing instructions to a computer. So when you use a computer program that's graphical, and you click a button, it just performs some series of actions that sends a command to a computer. So, for, for example, with the file explorer, when you double click on a folder, you know, the, you tell the fi file explorer, you know, go into that directory, which is change directory command from the command line, and then list the contents, which is a separate command. So, because things are chunked up and, you know, everything is more explicit, you have to do things, you have to chain multiple commands essentially when you're programming to perform what you think is one action, like opening a folder is actually open and list the contents. So it gets like, initially it might be a bit of a struggle that you like, you assume things should just uh, work in a certain way and you don't quite. Um, so th that's, I think, an important concept to, to realize. Um, the other things are just, you know, like, don't be scared off. Um, like Tim showed all that API documentation, uh, I think part of the issue as well is that people who often teach people, other people programming, um, they have a whole bunch of kind of institutional, uh, institutional knowledge or like, you know, uh, existing knowledge. And it's hard for anyone who's educating to like know, you know, if I start using the command line and typing in commands and you don't know what those commands do, it can be very confusing. Um, and it's not that anybody knows these commands by magic. Part of the challenge with programming and using command line interfaces is that you don't have buttons that you know, have tooltips that tell you what they do. You have to learn all those commands, which just really comes from experience and from like referencing the documentation, which is why Tim brings it up here. But also, I think when people learn from others, uh, it gets a bit challenging because you just assume these people have some sort of superhuman capability to, <laughs> that they know all of these things off the top of their head, but it really is just time in the saddle. But uh, yeah, a lot of it is also about thinking about, like, so for example, if I'm working in the domain of GIS, which is probably where you're going to be doing any coding, um, you already know the conceptual domain that you're working in, right? You know that the points and lines and polygons exist, you know symbols and uh, uh, colors and uh, coordinate references, all these things you already know exist. And if, you, if I asked you to describe a point, you would eventually come up to, to some kind of explanation where you said, well, it's something that's defined with an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, possibly a Z coordinate um, and a coordinate reference. So you come up with this like framework or, like of, within your knowledge domain to describe that thing. And if you just use your own knowledge, I mean, you already got basically 80% of the job done because you already know your craft. Um, and then you're just looking to see how those concepts were expressed in the programming language. So, for example, like if I've got a point, like how do I how do I find out what the x of the point is? Well, you'll see here there's a, there's a set um, x, and there's probably also just an x. If we search for x here, we'll see um, there's x, and it just gives you back the, the x coordinate, and there's the y it gives you back the y coordinate. So, like being able to map your existing knowledge, which covers 80% of what you're trying to do, is like use your knowledge to perform a sequence of tasks and then you go look in the programming language to see like, how do they enable me to do what I know a point should be able to do. You know? And that's where you've got to read in the docs or uh, look at example code or just explore and discover. Some, some of the IDEs like um, here I'm using VS Code and I was playing around with it last night which sort of got me thinking about the today's topic. Um, they give you really nice things. So, like, I can say, for example, from, okay, you need to know about the, the syntax for doing this from thing here. But I'm basically saying I want to, like, load into the, the programming environment um, the, the concept of a line. So, for example, I can say um, import Q just, um, let's see. Um, uh, actually, it doesn't, I wonder if it's not going to do it on this one. Um, it's because your libraries aren't loaded in the current e, Python, on, Python environment. On my um, <laughs> laptop, they were just automatically there. That's what I was going to say was really nice about it. But um, yeah, uh, you have to it, set your interpreter here. <laughs> yeah, it, it was just all automatic on my on my other machine. But um, but once you once you've pulled something in, like if I've got a point, I can say point. It should be able to say um, equals. You just 
you see that it's sort of like finishing the word for me. Okay, it's um, it's not doing it like I wanted it to do here. Um, let's just put it like that, and then if I say point dot, okay, on my laptop it like gives you the list of all the things you can do with the point, but I've got to go and configure something in my programming environment. If you do that in the QGIS console, it should do that. So if I say um, Abby's wonderful point dot. Okay, also not set up. But if you if you go spend a bit of time, you can actually get it to like when you type that dot, it will give you the listing of all the things here that you can do with that dot. I just didn't have my machine here prepped properly for doing that. Um, any last? I think also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, if you want to bring up your draw I/O diagram, <laughs> I think yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like e even just getting started, the, the one thing I would suggest to people is firstly identify like places where code has value, like iteration. You know, don't go and you know manually process you know sixty points in a file or something. You know, try and find a way to iterate over them individually, and you should be able to find snippets of code online, stack, stack overflow, and so on, or like just ask the community channels, and people will actually help you more than likely. Um, and then if you take those snippets and you execute them, don't do, uh, I've seen a lot of people just kind of like copy and paste code blindly or swap out a, a parameter or variable and be done with it. Like, I think it's worth taking the time to look at these elements that have been identified in this chart and then like read the code, figure out which elements, are, you know, are, are what, you know, what is an operator, what is a variable, what is a, a function, um, and then understand what the code is running. And then you, you will actually build your knowledge and your skill just by being able to read um, and understand what other people's code does. And it also, it helps when you, uh, I mean, one of the, the greatest skills with, with coding and programming is being able to take other people's existing um, infrastructure, like plugins and so on, and customize it to, to your needs. So like, you know, you don't have to do everything from scratch. Uh, building on other people's knowledge and expertise is also like a, a pretty viable route. You just have to be conscious about like um, paying attention when you're doing it and not just you know, uh, paste and enter. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why open source is so exciting because um, what you do is like every time you install a plugin in QGIS or something like that, somebody's actually sharing a bunch of code with you that you can actually go look at and copy and um, like adapt to your own purposes. And, and, and like it just opens up this huge world for you of capabilities that you'd never have if the code was not being shipped in a way that you could read the code. Um, so, yeah, uh, maybe we can just wrap up here by, by saying we're not asking you all to go off and become computer science experts, but I think in your career path, like learning enough about coding that you can use it to like pragmatically solve your own problems is really what I'm after. and. Um, to do that, you need to dabble and play with it and not be scared of it and, and understand the basic framework of how coding works so that when you're looking at it, you've got some like basis of understanding rather than just seeing it as lines of gobbledygook on the screen that just make no sense to you. Um, are there any final questions or thoughts before I stop the recording from the GIS crew? Nope, no questions for me. No. No. Are you are you excited or um, <laughs> running for the hills at the thought of writing? <laughs> You've sort of jogged my memory of a couple of things we did in R and Varsity and a couple of coding things we did in Python. So I think I need to go and brush up, and then I'll be more excited. <laughs> Three thousand lines on my desk Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, sure. <laughs> well, what I was actually going to ask you was for, for the next session to make a, like maybe just 10 lines or some simple little program that you can do in the QGIS console or even on the, like you can do it in R or Python or whatever, um, assembly language, C++, whatever you prefer. <laughs> and um, just to show like basically that you were able to take this session and actually apply it to some little problem. It doesn't have to be, it could be just uh, printing Hello World on the screen or it could be doing something that's useful in your work. And just like as a little challenge, just go off and make a little program and then share it with us um, on Slack or whatever.
Cool. Challenge accepted. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Okay. okay. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording there. Thank you for everybody who's been following along. And um, I hope you all out, out there on the internet, uh, if you're a GIS professional, also get inspired to maybe go and dabble a bit with some coding. Thanks for watching.